Welcome to KJV Cafe, where we explore great truths from God's holy word in a simple, down-to-earth fashion. Romans 10:17 shows us where faith comes from. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's grow our faith together in the cafe today. Our program is hosted by Pastor Clark Covington and brought to you by Heartland Ministries. Grab your Bible and a hot cup of coffee or tea and join us now as we explore God's holy word. Testing one, two, three. Testing Amen. One, two, three. Glory to God. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the cafe. Today we are talking about something people encounter every day. And I'm speaking here to believers. We're going to be looking at a verse from Paul and Paul often, if not always, writes to believers. And what we're looking at today is something believers struggle with. Maybe you are struggling with this today. And that is how not to fulfill the lust of the flesh, but to walk in the spirit. Saved Christians are waging an internal war each day, a battle between good and evil. This war has great consequences. The war that you and I are fighting has far-reaching consequences that result in whether we are either fruitful for God or not, whether we are sinning against God or not, whether we are serving God or not, whether we are living in closeness to God or not, whether we are living in peace or not, whether we are living as God intended his children to live or not. You know, this is such a big, important topic that really it shouldn't be ignored and it shouldn't be buried deep on a list of things to to, to look at. Amen. This shouldn't be like, okay, well, the preacher was talking about how not to fulfill the lust of the flesh, but to walk in the spirit. Well, I'll get to that in a couple of months, or I'll look at that later. This is something that needs our immediate attention. And I don't know that I've said that on the program. And we're we're over, I think we're about 100 episodes in. So 100 weeks, I don't think I've ever said this needs your immediate attention, but I will today because it's that important. You know, Jesus himself comments on this uh, this issue. Matthew 26, 41, when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he was speaking uh, to Peter, I believe, because he was, he was about to be portrayed. Uh, he was about to have his passion come to uh, fruition. He knew that the, 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 the bitter cup of sin for all humanity, he would have to drink. He was pleading with, with God the Father saying, please, I don't want to do this if it's possible, but nevertheless, let your will be done. And he asked them, he said, I, I'm sorrowful to the point I could die. Stay up with me. He asked them to stay up with him, his disciples. And he goes a, a little ways off and he's praying for one hour and they fall asleep. <laughs> And he's like, he told them, look, you need to watch and pray. These are action steps that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, isn't that our life? And I'm going to take it a step back from the serious state of what Jesus was dealing with to the more mundane and ordinary. How many times have you wanted to do something for God and not been able to do it? How many times has this issue come up of you know, for lack of a better word, being distracted or sidetracked. Just last night, I'll be honest, usually sermon prep for me isn't too difficult because I'm throughout the week, I'm, I'm studying the Bible, I'm listening to, to Bible studies and so forth, watching them. And so when I get to sermon prep, it's like the Lord lays a message on my heart and it just starts to kind of cascade onto the outline. And if anything, I'm just making sure I don't have too much on there. Uh, but this week, sermon prep was much harder. Uh, there was a work that I was fiddling with and, and, you know, my day work, so to speak, uh, that I do. And then there was kids, the kids were around and, uh, they want to see pictures and I'm showing them pictures and I could just see myself clearly procrastinating. I wanted to do something for God. That's work on this message. Amen. To share it with you. And I was having trouble dialing in to work on it. Uh, another example I thought of is eating healthy. Everyone knows that it's good to eat healthy. The mind understands that it's good to eat healthy, right? So we all deep down, we know it is good to live for God. We know that there's peace in serving the Lord and spending time with God and doing his will. Amen. We know these things, but then what do we do? Well, just like the eating example, we often turn to the bad stuff. Amen. We often turn to the 
uh, the things our body is craving, fat and salt. So you have the mind understanding and wanting to do something good and the body saying, no, I insist on something bad. And have you ever wondered why? Why is it this way? I believe the Lord allows things like distractions and procrastination and things like um, the body desiring bad food and the mind understanding that it needs good food. I think that the Lord allows these things to help us understand in a very simple way uh, this very serious and big biblical con- uh, concept that is in all of our lives, this inner war, this inner conflict that's in all of our lives. And Paul, he gives us the remedy here, and he gives us a really good piece of scripture, very familiar for many of you, I'm sure, from Galatians, Galatians 5, 16 through 26. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, capital S, Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. And so we see here in Galatians 5, 16 through 26, a, a clear command saying, look, if you walk in the Spirit, you, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But you may wonder, what is the lust of the flesh? Verse 19 answers that of Galatians 5. That's just the very next verse. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such the like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow, that is the lust of the flesh. And we'll get to that in a minute. But I will say that just because you don't practice magic in your house doesn't mean you're not committing these lusts of the flesh. And now, what's the other end? And you walk in the Spirit? What, what is that? Well, the fruit of the Spirit here, verse 22 is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, or moderation. Against such there is no law. And I, the last one, temperance, I said moderation, just to clarify. Uh, verse 24, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And they that are Christ's, so if you're Christ, if you're saved, then you have crucified the flesh, and along with that flesh were the affections and the lusts. Verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, capital S, let us also walk in the Spirit, capital S. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. And so here Paul is telling us about this very real battle between the Spirit uh, and the flesh. And it is a very real battle. You know, walk in the Spirit, that idea is an action step. It's not easy. If it were easy, we wouldn't be discussing it today. Because the idea is this, that as Paul is writing, you're no longer under the law when you're saved. And again, I'm speaking here primarily to the saved Christian here today. If you have accepted Christ as Savior, and you truly meant it, you made him Lord of your life, you understand your, understood your need for a, a Savior, right? And you accept Christ as your Savior, then what's going to happen, Amen. Okay, well, once you're saved, amen, what you're going to do is then you're going to uh, uh, have the Holy Spirit living within you. That's the capital S Spirit, amen. And you could be getting the fruits of the Spirit, like peace, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, if you walk in the Spirit. But you, your body is still in a mortal body, right? Your body is still getting old, decaying, problems. If you know anything about age, it seems like the older you get, the more your body starts to fall apart, amen? I know not for everybody, but for many people, uh, this household included. And so our body, that picture of our body uh, uh, becoming older and more sickly is an example of of this Adamic nature, the old Adam that we have living within us. And so even though we're saved and we have the spirit, amen, we're also in the flesh. And that's why Paul is writing here uh, 
that in verse 17 of Galatians 5, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. And so what you have here is you've got one side of you telling you, hey, let's do something for the Lord. And another side of you telling you, no, I just want to uh, do something for me, right? Or I want to do what I desire to do, which could be something that is not uh, godly. Amen. Those two are battling each other. I heard a preacher once say, uh, whichever side you feed more, that's the one that's going to prevail. And I, I sort of agree with that. Yeah, if you're feeding uh, the spirit, then certainly you're going to have more um, a more ability to walk in the spirit. But I think it's deeper than that. You know, even Paul struggled with this. Paul himself, Paul the apostle, the great apostle, the one we get our doctrine from. Uh, here in Romans 7, 18 through 25, he writes about it. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more that I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So we see here Paul is mentioning the same kind of conundrum in Romans as he addresses in Galatians, the idea that, he knows what he wants to do, but he can't find any good in, in and of himself. And so he, fi he finds himself at a stopping point. And again, if I had a list of all the things I intended to do for God that I never did because of the flesh or whatever reason, I believe it'd be a long list. And if you know me, I try my best to serve the Lord, just like Paul was doing. Amen. Verse 21, I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into camp captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of, from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So when the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And so Paul here is mentioning that he has the spirit living within him. He believes on Jesus Christ. He literally met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and was converted gloriously and served the Lord until his uh, martyr, martyrdom, until he was uh, killed. Amen. Serving God, standing up for the gospel that he brought to the Gentile people, which is us. Amen. Those that are listening today, for the most part, we're all Gentiles. Amen. And we got our doctrine from Paul, this new revelation. And Paul's saying he struggles with it. And, and that, the, that, that the, the law of uh, sin is in his members or his body. And so we see here, it's a very challenging thing. Amen. I mean, can you think about this? Uh, think about having an enemy within. Amen. Is that not what this is? An enemy within? An enemy living within you? An enemy that is not serving you correctly? An enemy that is leading you down the wrong path? Amen. If that's not what this is, I don't know what it is. It's an enemy within. You know, when you get in the ministry, you kind of have a magnifying glass on who you are and your walk. Amen. And, and it, it helps put this in perspective because now you're more conscious, right? And you're saying, man, wow, you know, I, I really, you know, I have a temper today or uh, haven't shown the kind of kindness today that I should, or uh, I need to be more giving, whatever it is, amen. You kind of put that magnifying glass in your life and you realize that there's something hindering you and it's real, amen. And Paul is mentioning here that there is a, 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 uh, result for how you walk, you know, and if you walk in the flesh, you're going to have one result, uh, the works of the flesh. And if you walk in the spirit, you're going to have the fruit of the spirit. Amen. And I'm glad he didn't call it the fruit of the flesh because there's no fruit in serving the flesh. Amen. There's just works. Uh, we're all walking one way or another, either backwards or forwards. Those that are living in sin, that's what that's called. Um, the Bible word would be vanity. And vanity means improper use, vain use. Vanity means something that is not, it's not the way it was used and the example, the way it was intended to be used, the example I always give, and I love cars, I have nothing against cars, but if you look at a car, what's the point of a car? To get you from point A to point B. And so if you spend X amount of dollars on a car to get you to point A to point B, okay, that is the, the proper use of that vehicle, amen? Now, if you go in and you say, okay, I'm going to buy the most expensive sports car in the world, and I'm going to use that to drive to work, amen? Now, that may be nice. I would like to drive it too, okay? Everybody would like to drive it. Most guys like to drive it. Hey, get this. 
that's not the intended use of that of of a car. It's to go to point A to point B, and so you are now living uh, vainly. That's why you can see somebody with a real hot car and say, "Oh, they're vain." Amen. Well, not necessarily. And again, nothing wrong with cars. And if you have a great one, uh, that's great, and you have passion for it, and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, the idea of proper use, a car to get to point A to B, point B, transportation, and the idea of improper use, a you know million dollar ridiculous sports car that you're just driving around saying, everybody look at me, okay? That is what it means by vanity. And those that are living in the flesh, even though it feels natural to them, are living with improper use. They are living for themselves. And so it feels natural, and this is what's ironic about God's ways, even though he created everything when the devil corrupted man through Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and it's been passed down from generation to generation, what happened? Improper use, vanity entered the picture. And man started coming up with their own ways and their own ideas and talking about billions of years and talking about uh, how they how uh, we became something out of nothing and all this other crazy stuff. Man started saying that they're their own gods, creating idols to worship, uh, living for themselves, materialism crept in, all of these different isms like relativism and so forth. And that is how man has become so prone to walking in the flesh because it feels natural to them. And in the world it is fleshly. I mean, again, uh, I was speaking to an officer of the law the other day, and they said that the young people especially have been groomed to disrespect police and to try to get something on YouTube. And, you know, a lot of people would celebrate them disrespecting law enforcement. And the Bible tells us that God put these individuals, and I know that there's bad apples here and there, but largely these people went into law enforcement because they love people and they want to help them and serve. God put them there, the Bible tells us, to protect us from evil. And so when someone's on YouTube, you know, smarting off to a law enforcement officer, a lot of times what they're doing is they're showing this vain, improper use of their flesh. They're living for the flesh. And what I'm saying is the world will celebrate that. So then they're gratified by it and they want to do it again. And that's a simple example, but follow that down through the rabbit hole, social media, whatever else. And that's how many people are living. They're living with improper use. We went to the beach. Uh, we went to a Christian campground. And we had the, I was stunned uh, how many people there uh, with, with, with some of their attire where I, I would have to look away or my, I have to like close my kid's eyes because of what they were wearing at a Christian campground. And I asked myself, you know, these good people, I mean, they don't look comfortable in these things. You know, the glimpse I'm going to have to look away from, right, is not comfortable for them. Why are they wearing this? It's not going to help them swim. Well, they got it from the culture, from the world, amen? And it, again, it's improper use. A swimsuit should be for you to go swimming and your clothes not to get all rough or something and give you a rash, but instead a swimsuit becomes something that you want to show yourself off with, and that's that's not meekness and that's, and that's not humility and all these things. And so the culture pushes this idea of improper use, of vanity. And when we live for the works of the flesh, these are kind of extreme examples, but when we live that way, we are not living for God. I mean, it's simple. It's happy hour and the and work. Work says, come to happy hour and we're going to celebrate uh, whatever. And you're saying, well, it's work. And they're saying, let's celebrate, right? And so you go along with the culture you, and, you're, and you're drinking. You're no longer of a sober mind. You're no longer home with your family, on and on and on. That's, these are just simple examples. But the works of the flesh lead to really bad things. And, and yet we understand the wages of sin is death. And yet we still do these things. Uh, idolatry, having all, all idols in our life, adultery, uh, fornication, sex without marriage, uncleanness, uh, uh, lasciviousness, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath and strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, that's coveting, is it not? Murders, drunkenness, revelings, rebelling is what I spoke about. Uh, and, 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 and Paul saying, by the way, the, you know, people that are doing these things, they have no, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. And there was a documentary on homosexuality where they mentioned this verse, a uh, guy that had, had been homosexual, that had, had, uh, repented and, and got right with God. He mentioned this verse, Galatians five, I believe it was uh, 21, uh, saying that, that, look, this is very important to the movement because if they could just retranslate that verse, they could have this idea of being a Christian without having to repent, and that was hard for them. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And so we can choose to walk in the Spirit, take that action step, 
and get away from the ways of the flesh. And you say, well, Brother Clark, how do we do that in this day and age? How do we choose to walk in the spirit? Well, why don't we take a step back and look at what Christ did for us? You know, in verse 24, we see of our text verse, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And so we understand that when we're saved by Christ, we are bought with his precious blood. The idea, the same Jesus I spoke about in Matthew that did not want to go to the cross. Who would, amen? He must have been terrified. doesn't matter. He's God in the flesh. He's still in the flesh. He's terrified, amen? He lived a sinless, perfect life, born of a virgin, 33 and a half years. He's going to have to go to this cross and be humiliated and beaten to the point he's unrecognizable. And on top of that, drink the cup of sin. He's going to have to take the sin of all humanity on his shoulders. Amen. God, the father himself will have to turn away from him for that season so that he can die, provide the sinless, spotless lamb sacrifice that only he could do. And when Christ died on the cross for our sins, what did he do? The expectation is of God the Father, amen, and God the Son. Now that he did it, when he's risen again anew, he has that resurrected body. They thought he was the gardener when they went to go see him. Amen. They, cu they couldn't recognize him. They didn't understand. He has a resurrected body. He can come and go. Amen. He's seen by over 500. He's on the earth for 40 days. The expectation is now that when we're saved, the old man, the sinful man dies within us and we are raised anew. We are raised afresh, afresh. The old man is crucified. And so why then, if the old man is crucified, are we going back to these fleshly ways? Jesus is our example. He died to self first. He literally died to self. He was completely selfless. No ordinary human could do what he did. And yet he did it because he loved us and he loved the Father. He fulfilled God's will. He is now highly exalted in heaven for an eternity. And so he has eternal fruit from this. All that are his, God in the Bible says, will not lose one. All that are his will be with him. And if we are his, if we've been saved, if we've been born again, amen, how dare we take it lightly of living in the flesh? How dare we gossip a little? How dare we get drunk a little? How dare we dabble in pornography? How dare we lie to our, our friends? How dare we scheme against another? How dare we on and on and on? How dare we? Every time the flesh wants, that, wants you to do something like this, we need to convict ourselves of what Christ did on the cross. Bring it to memory, if you will. I'll tell you a story. When I was young, I was a goofball. I was always getting in trouble. Uh, I was I was uh, from a broken home, and I'm not making excuses in that regard other than to say that I really wasn't maybe taught how to behave, uh, you know, at a young age. I'll put it that way. And I always was cracking up in class, and I, I had trouble sitting still and paying attention. And I loved my grandma so much. And if I had to calm down, I would always just think of my grandma's passing because it was the most sobering thing I could think of. And that worked. And it sounds crazy, but it was effective because, again, all my friends are expecting me to joke around and goof off, laughed in class. And I was trying to get out of there, you know, trying to go to go to college, not get kicked out or something. And so I always think of my grandma. And it, it sounds weird, but it was very effective. Uh, and yet when we have this nature, this desire uh, to not to not think on the godly things and not turn to God, why don't we think of Christ? I mean, if grandma sobered me up, how much more so think of what Christ did on the cross for you and for me? How much more so just beholding Christ in his glory and his honor, understanding that he is the Messiah and that he's risen and that he's alive today and that he's looking down upon you. I heard a preacher say one time, I believe it was Erwin Lutzer from the Moody Bible Institute. He said, when you watch TV, imagine Christ is sitting right there. Or better yet, imagine he's within you because he is if you've been saved. So what you're watching, he's watching right? Run it by Christ. Amen. How about every thought? Bring it in subjection to Christ. Amen. We need to look at our fleshly lusts, the big ones. Okay. You're going to go rob a bank or the littlest ones. Um, you're not going to read your Bible today, even though that's not a little one, I'd say, but a, like a less controversial one. You're not going to read your Bible. You're not going to pray. You're going to fall asleep when you pray. You're not going to witness to others. You're not going to hand out that gospel track, whatever it is. Let's not, let's not let these things slip away that God would have us to do. It's our turn. We are to suffer well, to crucify the desires of the flesh. Amen. 
There is no glory in quitting or giving in or chalking this up as okay. Amen. God wants you to know it's not okay. That's why I believe he's having me preach on this today. It is not okay to give in to the desires of the flesh. And Paul himself says, I've got a remedy for you. Walk in the spirit. It means to walk in the spirit means to get close to God, to saturate yourself in the word of God, to pray without ceasing. Amen. To turn to God in all ways, to live as a fundamental Bible believing Christian should live. Amen. Depart from this world. Get away from the unclean thing. I had a football coach in middle school. It says, you don't want to be around the bad ladies. Don't go to the place where the bad ladies are. And I won't, I, that was the G-rated version, but it was a very effective statement for some middle schoolers. He was saying, you know, you don't want to drink. Don't go to the bar. You know, you don't want to be around the bad thing. Don't go to, near the bad thing. How many people keep going near the bad thing and saying, oh, oops, 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 stay away from it. Ignorance is not an excuse. God's word highlights this for a reason. Christian Christians, I sadly believe, are guilty of this in droves, of walking in the flesh, though they should walk in the spirit. And besides being guilty of this, Christians are suffering unnecessarily because of it. To bring God the glory, we must walk in the spirit. Is this not why we are here today? Galatians 5.16, this I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. This is why we're here today, to walk in the spirit to live for God, to bring glory to God. And you say, well, Brother Clark, I don't know how to walk in the Spirit. Well, that's okay. There is the Bible. And what you need to do is make the Bible a very big priority, the number one priority in your life. Read it in the morning, maybe read it in the evening, in the afternoon. And now you pray alongside with reading the Bible. And if you don't understand things, there's understand what the Bible's saying. There's commentaries, there's preaching like this, there's uh, videos online, there's maps and on and on and on. And find what works for you. How you can walk in the Spirit is to understand who God is and desire to know Him well. The idea is God wants a relationship with you. And many, whether they're saved or not, have turned their backs on God. And they don't want anything to do with God. And it's sad because He created them and He has a plan for them and He wants to bless them and He wants to have a relationship with them. But you can be different, friend. You can be different. You can turn to God. Imagine a room. And you have 100 people in there and 99, their backs turned to God and he's in the center of the room. The 99 of their backs turned, but you, you turn around and you look at God and you say, I want to know you. I want to be close to you. I want to walk with you. I want to understand what, what you did for me. I want, I want to live for you. I don't, I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to walk in the spirit. Will God not answer that prayer? Will God not reveal to you the things through his word that you should be doing each day? We're not going to be perfect. We all fall short. That's why there's something called repentance, the idea of sanctification, the idea that we every day need to go to the Lord and and repent before him and get right with him. But he will guide us. He will not forsake us. He will not leave us. We should not take the idea of being saved lightly. We should take that as the beginning step of a lifelong commitment to God Almighty and to stop making excuses. Stop, stop claiming ignorance. It it doesn't work. It doesn't fly. Think about this. God is all knowing, right? God's all knowing. Oh God, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, get to your word today because I was in a traffic jam. Well, God knows all the 23 other hours of the day and what you did and didn't do. I mean, he's all knowing. Amen. So let's stop making excuses. Let's stop claiming ignorance. Let's, 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 let's look at what Paul himself, the apostle was struggling with and say that we're not too big of a Christian to deal with this because obviously we all deal with it. And let's walk in the spirit because if this is the beautiful part of the scripture, if we walk in the spirit, right? If we turn to God, if we enrich the Holy Spirit, we don't grieve the Holy Spirit. We depart from sin. We walk with him. If we walk in the spirit, then we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We won't be doing that because we're doing this other thing. Amen. It's the same idea. We won't be getting in trouble uh, doing something with a bad crowd because we are with the best of the good crowd. That's God himself. And we have that opportunity. We can approach the throne room boldly. So why don't we? Why don't we do it? Again, the devil doesn't want you to do it. The devil does not want you to hear this message. I can promise you that. He's been fighting all night and all day over this message. But to God be the glory if you hear it, to God be the glory that it sinks in in your heart, and to God be the glory as you take action on this and as you walk in the, in the spirit and you do not fulfill the lust of the flesh and you crucify those desires because Christ is worthy, amen. He is worthy. I thank you so much for listening today. Please apply this to your heart and your life and pray to God that he'll help you. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Thanks for listening to this episode of KJV Cafe. Have a question for Pastor Clark? Email him directly at clark at enduringpromise.org or visit kjvcafe.com and click the envelope button on the homepage. Our program is hosted by Pastor Clark Covington and brought to you by Heartland Ministries. We'll close today with Psalm 119, verses 166 through 168. Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation and done thy commandments. My soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies, for all my ways are before thee.